Credere non posso! Resistenza sua è incredibile, se... Forza nei placer, no? <ride> Mutate il flagello! Ho con Clavis, eh? No! Kang! Un frannobis può di Betu! Prova e studi! Quale? Mi mi sto parlo! Gusta! Gusta! salvation message 
Um, a lot of times, so people remember what's going on, there's little acronyms that we use, like there's an ABC, you might even be familiar with that one, the ABC of salvation. A stands for admit you're a sinner, B stands for believe Jesus is the Son of God, and then C, confess your sins, you got ABC. Well, the thing I propose to you today is that you don't even have to remember ABC, all you have to remember is A. But the other side of it is this, that it's a really deep A. It's a really uh, deep A in the meaning of what we have to accept. And it's a very all-encompassing A. And this is where you start hitting my heart of hearts and my desires. Because we have a superficial faith that tends to run through our churches in, in America today. And we need some depth on things. And, and even, even for the little icon that's up there, is that you can't grow any higher than you go down. The roots have to be deep for you to go up. And, and so we need a deep understanding of what this A of acceptance is. And, and people can take God so casually in this A side of things because uh, there's no deep roots. And so it's easy to fall away this way or another. So what are the deep sides of this A? What, what's life changing in, in this A word? And that hence the sermon, by the way, the big A. The word is acceptance. <laughs> And acceptance starts actually with ourselves, accepting certain things about ourselves. Well, aren't we talking salvation with God? Why does acceptance start with ourselves? We must accept ourselves. Well, yeah, but maybe not in the clinical way that's so popular today. And now A is our letter, but when it comes to ourselves, E is going to be the reference. E's, and there's a number of E's, three E's for ourselves, what we accept. What do we accept about ourselves? One, the first E is enemy. Enemy. Wow, where are you going with that? Well, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked words, yet now he has reconciled. Colossians 1.21. See, we need to start here. You see, there's no neutral ground. There is none. Uh, people say, well, I, it's not that I disbelieve in God. I just don't really kind of believe anything. He's just kind of on the shelf there. Uh, I'm neutral. Well, in God's eyes, there is no such thing. You are either reconciled or you are his enemy. Reconciled. You are friend or you are enemy. There is no in-between ground. There's no in-between ground. But then let's consider who we're talking about. The one true God, as we understand through Scripture, is the creator of everything. Not only is this the person force that created everything, he is the one who sustains it all. Everything continues to exist because God allows it to. That's what we say. Oh, that's what Scripture says, and that's what we accept from Scripture. Well, if we're the enemy of God, to be the enemy of the person who not only created everything, but is actively sustaining it all even as we speak, Man, if you're going to have an enemy in your life, that sure seems like the wrong person to be your enemy, does it not? You're the enemy of God, but yet everyone in here is or has been the enemy of God. The creator of all things. And we need to accept in ourselves the truth that we have been God's enemy. This carries some very deep implication because... Because if, if God is just somebody you were kind of neutral about and, you know, well, I don't bother God, God doesn't bother And then at some point you decide, I think I'm going to try and get right with God and I'll accept Him. Then it, it's almost a little more than a self-improvement thing. I, I just want to kick it up a notch in my life. I just want to be a better person, so I'm going to try and connect with God. Uh, that That's... Not a very deep thing, and it's no wonder we see folks come in and, and they're, they're kind of lit up for a little while, and the next thing they're not. But if we understand, if you are enemy to what has created and sustains all things, you are in, and if I may use a theological term, you are in deep doo-doo. I don't know if that's a new translation, Mike. But the truth is that that is a bad, bad place to be. And it's urgent to get out of there. And if there's something that can correct this relationship, man, it is really, really important. And, and it, because you are saved from such a bad place to such a good place, it becomes very precious. Salvation needs to have that meaning. But it has to start with accepting this about yourself. 
If you're not right with God, it's not a neutral thing. You are his enemy. Nasty, nasty place. The second uh, thing it is, or E, that we're talking about here is the word empty. Empty. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of this world. See, that's, when you get into all the schmooze and, and, and is this for real stuff, it is the traditions of this world. You know, that's kind of what you expect. Somebody calls you, how are you doing? I want to tell you about it. Okay, what are you selling me? Here it comes. The empty advice as a tradition and basic principles of this world. Colossians 2 way. Every human condition and tradition in itself can be extremely, extremely empty. Think of the number of ways that a human being can be empty. You can be empty in meaning. I don't know why I'm here. Empty in purpose. Empty in vision. I don't know where it's going. You can be empty in morals. You can be empty in your understanding. Even as we sit and you can look at God's Word and memorize it and it can mean nothing to you. Empty in understanding. Empty in truth. We live in a culture that says there is no truth. Everything's relative. They're real easy on that one. Empty uh, as a victim of empty advice or a giver of empty advice. Seems everybody has an opinion. I wonder how many really mean that much. All these things, or you can simply just plain be suffering from emptiness. Have you never? You know no one who at some point has said, I just feel empty inside. I'm just empty. And you need something to be filled in that. Salvation is all about being filled by what is good. But how can you be filled until you realize in your heart of hearts, not just abstract thinking, that you are in fact empty and need to be filled? Salvation starts with a sense of that need. And, and you know what? You and I can't even bring it to ourselves. It's, it's a movement by the Holy Spirit to get in there. But at some point, if we don't realize we're empty, we will never need to be filled. Once again, superficial. Unless we understand and accept the need. Yes, I am empty. Of all that good, I am empty. And the third E is probably the least popular of all the E's. You don't hear much about it uh, so much in, in, in uh, sermons in these days. And the third E is eternally lost. Eternally lost. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelations 20, 14 and 15. You know, it's really interesting. You go through Scripture, Old and New Testament, there's two books mentioned uh, as a theme all the way through. And the first book is the book of Judgment. And when we read in Daniel or in Ezra, uh, you can find it in there. And the concept's pretty straightforward. And I like the way Barclay puts this, so I'm just going to, uh, to, to quote him on, on his statement on this. All through life, we are writing our own destiny. All through life, we are writing our own destiny. It is not so much that God judges a man as that a man writes his own judgment. You were right, and you know, the, the whole thing of how could God judge people? Well, maybe the fact is you're writing your own name in that book. That's where the book of judgment comes from. You are writing your own destiny in there. You're putting your name in that book. The second book is called the book of life. And we find that all through. And it goes back to something of ancient times as well. Actually, a, a non-religious reference is that every, every kingdom, the king would have a book. Uh, it was just kind of a protocol in, back in those days. And everyone who was a citizen of that kingdom there, and living would have their name in this book. Every living person. And when you passed away and you were no longer a living citizen in this kingdom, they would take your name out of the book. Of course, others born and their names would be added. But if, if you were not living, you'd be taken out. Therein lies what this is talking about. It is uh, the living citizens of God's kingdom that are in that book. It, it's kind of like the precursor to the passport. You know, we, we kind of talked about that a bit. You ever cross the border anywhere and you come back and, you, and you're coming back into the country and you give a passport? Well, you know, you don't show up and say, well, I hope I'm American enough 
you know, when you get the passport simply tells who you are. You already are what is in that passport before you ever give it. You know of what it says. And and that's the way it is, it is that you're born into it. That's the bottom line. To be a citizen of a country, you are essentially born into that, that you know, of course we can be naturalized, uh, you immigrate some folks, but in a sense they are being reborn uh, into a, a new identity, into this country. And, and Jesus himself says, so any wonder, he says you need to be born again, you need to be born into this kingdom. Now, here's the thing about this, talking about American culture is, is you know, you can go anywhere in the world and you can find people who can rap American style. And they can wear American style clothing. There are people out there in other countries who look more American than you do. You know, they're just really into some American stuff. But the thing is, they're not American citizens. You know what, what the difference is between you and them? You have a passport or, or you have citizenship. Because you were born here, or naturalized. Jesus says you need to be born into that kingdom. There is this book of life, and the way your name gets in there is that you were born and you were an active, you were a living citizen in the kingdom of God. So here's the thing, if you're not born again, if you don't have the second birth, then you will suffer the second death. It's as simple as that. that. That's what God says. You are destined for the second death. It's either second birth or second death. There's the choices in all of this. It's some serious stuff. But it starts from the fact that all of us start from the second death. Until we have the second birth, that's where we're going. That's God's message to us. That's where it's headed. Not even God's, uh, the, the, we taught the wrath of God and all of that. That's true. God has his, you don't fool around with that power. But the truth is, it's us sitting there writing our own name in the other book. We have to admit, we have to accept in ourselves that in our own power, that's where we're headed. We're not the citizens. We must accept those three E's about ourselves. Okay, well, there's acceptance on that side, the big division. That's what we must accept about ourselves, or the salvation really doesn't have much meaning. But what do we accept about God? Well, if we're E's, God's letter is P. Okay? We're three E's, God's three P's. What are the P's there? Well, let's start with this one, perfect. Perfect. And does not be conformed, I'm reading Romans 12 too. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As I said, Romans 12, 2. Interesting little phrase here. You catch this after this transformation. What happens with the transformation? Well, then, then you're able to know the perfect will of God. Now, perfect, we shouldn't have too much trouble with. Perfect in any language is still perfect. It is without flaw. It, there's, there's no chinks in the armor. There's nothing to correct. It is perfect. Will is an interesting word. Will is it, it, it's a little bit amorphous. And will in, in the Greek, as, as he was uh, Paul's writing this letter, the meanings behind that word were uh, it means determination, it means choice, it means purpose, it means uh, volition, it means inclination, it means desire, and it means in what you take pleasure. You take all those aspects of a person, and God is a person would, a person. And, and that pretty well covers the basis of everything you are in your nature. It, it, it covers what you want. It, it covers why you want that thing. And it covers what you will do to get the thing you want. It pretty well covers everything about you. And the thing is, that's will. That is will. And God's will is perfect. It means that God wants something that is perfect. His plan for it is perfect. And the way He's going to carry it out is perfect. And that's all really nice and good until you realize, it gets personal, that all of this perfection is aimed directly at you. God wants the perfect thing to happen with your life. He has the perfect purpose. He has the perfect way to carry it out. That's what salvation says. Yeah, that's what it's all about. I mean, 
I don't know. Let's, let's just take a survey. Who, who would believe that God has a perfect will concerning you? Just, okay, there's, there's two of us. There's me and Sherry. There's a few other hands. <laughs> Ryan's taking on it. Okay. Well, that's interesting. The rest of you, you're either shy or honest. I'm not sure. Maybe both. But if that's true, all us hand raisers, uh, on this, that we really believe God's will is perfect concerning us, why is it that there are times that, um, that we get really overwhelmed with our worries and our concerns and our anxiety? Because we don't have that. We don't seem to. <laughs> uh, or why is it that uh, uh, we come up with this grand thing to do for God and it's like we're just going to help God out a little bit and do it our way? <clears throat> or why is it when we, we, uh, we know, we really sense God wants something done and done in a certain way and we resist doing it? For some reason. It really can only come down to one conclusion. Is that there must be something not perfect in the will of God. There's something imperfect because we need to help him out. Or we need to, to, to find another way to deal with this. God's will is perfect. And in the salvation thing, the first thing is accepting. You know, you know. Because have you ever run across somebody, especially in the same thing? I'm going to come... To Christ. I, I'm going to, to accept Christ. At some, but there's just some things I want to do first. There's some things I want to do. As if you've got some things that are more perfect than what God has waiting for you. God's will is perfect. And the salvation is accepting the enormity of that implication. P. The second P, though, still deals with will because it's wonderful. You know, that God wants to do this perfect stuff, but He hasn't got the power to pull it off. It doesn't mean much. And that's why God's second P is power. Second P is power. There's some tremendous verses on this. And see Paul talking to the Corinthians, a church that's so much like our churches today. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. There's no shortage of people who will either slam Christianity, make fun of it, but if we look at what it says, that's an old story. And it says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. They're in the other book. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. The message of the cross. And in Romans, another uh, megatropolis church. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Everybody is so cool with what they believe. But let me tell you what. I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. And believe there is getting into the deep age. We're not just talking some kind of esoteric thing. And that's what we're getting at. The truth is we all have serious challenges that go on. There are people in here with life-threatening diseases. There are people in here with life-threatening financial problems. There are people in here with all kinds of real life problems. But it comes down to this. Either God has the power to help us in what we're going through, and He has a perfect will if we'll just follow it, or He doesn't. Salvation means we accept God has the power. Well, He has the power and the perfect uh, and all of this, but what is it He wants to do if he, he, he can pull this up? What is it? Which brings us to the third P, which is promise promise. And this here is no surprise of all the churches Paul is talking to the Hebrew church in this one. Hebrews 9.15 And for this reason, he, that is Christ, is a mediator of the new covenant. Oh, what a thing to be telling Jews that hung their hat on the old covenant. By means of death, what we saw, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. We couldn't pull it off. That those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. What is Christianity all about? Is it a get out of jail free card through the card through this life? Not according to Scripture itself. Is it that uh, you'll have a new car if you pray hard enough by next week? Not according to this. The promise of God is the inheritance of eternal life. That is the promise. And it's not surprising he's telling this to the Hebrews because the Old Testament is all about promise and inheritance. That's what it's all... Uh, think about it. Abraham 
What was the story of Abraham? All about promise. I promise you, Abraham, even though you're this old guy, uh, and depending on the translation, old dude, <laughs> you're going to have a nation of promised children who are, are my children. And then, then we can go on to, to Moses. Moses, the whole thing, a promised land. It will be inherited, the, this, inherited this place of milk and honey. Go on to David. The promised land has been established. David, I promise you a lineage of kingship that will never end. And guess what? All that stuff happened. It was promised, and it was inheritance, and it came down, and it happened. We are promised eternal life. Just as real as all of these things. We are promised eternal life. We're not good enough to pull it off. We're not even good enough to pull off the first step. So guess what's written in Scripture? We love Him because He what? First loved us. 1 John 4, 19. God first loved us. Loved us. Salvation comes down to accepting there really is a promise and accepting that is the promise because that is what is said and God is perfect enough and powerful enough to pull off the promise even when you're going through all your quote real life stuff. That's the promise. Now here's something that gets like this is the this is all God thing that we're both to, to look at at this moment. And it's not in any other religion. It's not in any other human thinking because we can't do this kind of thing. We already start with this two-word sermon, right? Rejection is word one, and what's word two? Acceptance. Acceptance. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for sleeping. I am like so happy. Rejection equals darkness, death, tragedy. We looked at that. And acceptance was light and life and promise and all these positive things. <coughs> But let's go full circle now back to Isaiah 53 and what you saw on the screen, which is our remorse. We caused it to happen. And God takes rejection and opens, uses it to open the door for acceptance. Rejection is the power used behind acceptance. What? Only God can pull off something so amazing. So here we are having to accept the ease about ourselves. We are enemy. We are empty. We are eternally lost, left on our own. And then there's the peace of God. God is perfect. God is power. God is promise. Salvation is nothing more or less than this. The peace overcomes the ease, and you do it with the A. That is salvation. The peace overcomes the ease, and you do it with the A. But you got to understand the rules. Those words, how it works, how it works. That is salvation in a nutshell.